Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Um, today, I'd like to talk about the Bangkok Orange Line Metro project. Uh, this is a project that Arup are currently working through on the detailed design. Um, for the ultimate client and funder of the project is the MRTA, the Metro, the Mass Rapid Transit Authority of Thailand, and our direct client is Italian Thai, a contractor, Italian Thai Developments. That's their logo in orange. We also employed a few subcontractors to help with temporary works and architecture, and that's the other two logos at the bottom. <clears throat> um, I went to Thailand in 2017 until 2018 to work on this project, and I'll, I'll tell you about my overseas assignment during that time. This is what I'd like to cover tonight. So I'll, I'll give you an overview of Arabs' involvement in Thailand. Um, and then tell you about Bangkok and the need for metros there, the need for building new metro lines. Um, then I'll talk about the orange line itself and the challenges that we worked through during the detailed design stage. Um, I'll, I'll give a little overview of life on an overseas assignment and then show you a few photographs of my travels around Thailand and the region when I was there. This is a map of the Arab offices around the world. Uh, so there are a few in Southeast Asia and Australia around that region. The Bangkok office is shown in red. Um, it's quite a, a small regional office and depends a lot on larger offices in Singapore and Hong Kong for support. So the Bangkok office is around, there's around 15 people there. There's around 300 people in Singapore and around 1,000 in Hong Kong. Um, and then there's other offices in the region as well, China and down in Australia. Um, then just zooming in a little bit closer into the, the Southeast Asia area. I wasn't familiar with the geography um, of this area before I went and um, I was happy to, to call this, this part of the world home for just over a year. And just for scale, I've, I've shown the UK and Ireland Beside, beside Thailand, so the countries are similar size in area. They're also similar population. Thailand has around 70 million people, and Bangkok, which is just located um, at the top of the Gulf of Thailand, is a city of around 10 million people. So similar, similar size country and, and similar aspects of dealing with people and infrastructure to the UK, um, similar uh, population and similar problems that the need for moving, um, improving infrastructure, moving people and goods around, similar problems. So Arab's quite established in Singapore and Hong Kong, already established markets, and we're expanding into developing markets in the Philippines, Indonesia, and, and the growing market in Thailand as well. So there's a lot of a need, need for a lot of new construction work and lots of opportunities out there. There's also other companies operate in Thailand. Um, I came across Acom, Oricon from Australia, uh, Mott McDonald as well. So uh, there, there's lots of construction, lots of opportunities out there. Uh, Arup has been involved in Thailand for around 30 years now. So these are a few of the projects that we've worked on, including Burt's Bangkok Elevated Road and Train System. Uh, this project ran into some acrimony between the client and uh, the government over access to land and was never actually completed. So the, this, the concrete columns that have, had been constructed before the project was cancelled are, are still sticking up out of the ground and the Thai refer to them as Thailand Stonehenge. Um, more successful projects then include the Maha Nakhon Tower, which was the tallest building in Thailand up until a few years ago when a, a new building uh, took its spot. And then the Blue Line Metro Project and the Blue Line Extension Metro Project, uh, which I worked on during the 1990s and 2000s. Um, so they were two, two metro projects that we've already worked for the same contractor, Italian Thai Developments, and now, now we're moving on to the third metro project, the Orange Line. These are a few faces of people that worked on the Blue Line project in the 1990s, so around 20 years ago. 
Um, some of you might, some of the Arab people might recognise these faces, these people, the, uh, the top five people all work for Arab around the world. Um, Andy's in Thailand now, Peter's in Hong Kong, Jason's in Newcastle. Asim Gaba, the, one of the authors of Sirius C580 and C760, um, is in London, Anton's in London, and the Thai staff, Vilai, Yo, Tik and Noom, still work in Bangkok for, for Arab. Um, so you, you notice this picture of Asim was taken about 20 years ago, and I don't think he's aged much at all since then, so I, I perhaps need to ask him what his secret is. This is the Arab office in Thailand. So it's a temporary structure. Uh, we were based with the contractor in, a, in an area of the city where the MRTA owns some land. And we were co-located co with the contractor in a, in a temporary office. Arab also have a permanent office in a tower block in the city. However, for this project, this was where I was based in, in this project office. Um, just move on. This is inside the office with some posters of UK projects up to make me feel at home. Um, friendly office uh, environment there. And you'll notice the fans and air conditioned units as well. So in there were the old park hut now and again, and um, the office became stiflingly hot very quickly due to the, the climate in Thailand. So we're glad for the fans and air conditioning units there when the power was working. And this is a Thai dish pad pack guy. So there's a canteen on the site and we went there every day for lunch, a tasty, just a, a Thai meal, a standard Thai meal and very good value for money. So this was one pound for a nice lunch, keep, keep me going the rest of the day. So that's a little bit of an overview of Arab, Arab in Thailand. Then just moving on to Bangkok and the need for building metros in this country. This, this photograph is my first impression really of, of Thailand. So I arrived um, on a Sunday evening and a few other people also arrived the same day to, to start work on an overseas assignment. We went to a rooftop bar and, and this is a typical view over the center of Bangkok. You notice, first thing you notice is the, the traffic um, piled up. It's, it seems it, it's always there night and day. Um, <clears throat> very hard to get around without sitting in traffic. Uh, so I have a few more pictures like this. Um, this is another picture of the queue at traffic lights. Lots of cars and lo lots of motorbikes in, filtering in between. The, the motorbike drivers that are wearing orange jackets in the picture, they're actually motorbike taxis and you, you, you sit on, pay the fare and sit on the back and, and they'll take you to your destination. Um, you actually pay a premium to travel by motorbike taxi compared to an ordinary taxi just because um, even though you're taking your life in, in your hands getting on the back, um, you can, the, ta the motorbike taxis can take you through the traffic and get to your, you to your destination faster than, than an ordinary taxi where you're sitting in traffic. Um, and then Thailand's a tropical country. Uh, this, our summer is the, the rainy season in Thailand, roughly May to September. And it, scenes like this are quite common where there's heavy rainfall, flooding. Um, so it's either can rain heavily or it's, it's very hot. And if you try to walk or cycle, you run the risk of getting soaked either with rain or sweat. And as a result, people, there's really only one choice for people that are trying to travel across the city, and that's by, by car. So at, at the minute, there's a few metro lines, um, but if you live somewhere slightly off a metro line and you're trying to travel across the city to somewhere else off the metro line, the only choice you have is, is take the car. There are a few buses, um, they get stuck in traffic too and, and don't seem to, uh, they're, they're not a very pleasant way to travel. So ev everyone just travels, travels by car and, and the roads are congested. Um, that then affects in, uh, industries trying to rely on reliable journey times and deliveries. How can you get concrete to a construction site on time if your concrete lorry is stuck in traffic, things like that. So th there is a need to take people off the roads 
build a reliable commuter system that people can travel across the, the city uh, reliably, and that's where, where metros uh, provide the answer. This is the current metro layout in Bangkok. So there's five lines, a mix of underground and above ground lines. The blue line shown was the project that I worked on in the 1990s. The, the blue line extension that followed that is not open yet and isn't shown. Um, <clears throat> but if, if you look carefully, I'll bring up an overlay of the proposed metro lines then on top of this. So this is the plan to build five completely new lines and extend all of the existing lines and turn the network into to something more like the London Underground map um, and, and cover the city with, with metro stations. The, the, the orange line then runs from east to west and then from, from Rama 9 out to the east to Minbury that's the eastern section that, is, that has received government approval and, and is under construction at the minute. From Rama 9 to the E3 section is all underground, and then it comes up above ground out to Minbury. So that's about 20 kilometres of, of metro, 17 stations, and the total construction cost of all of that is 2.5 billion US dollars. Um, so quite good value for money compared to infrastructure in the UK. Um, the Orange Line E3 contract, that was the, the contract that, that is the contract that Arab are working on at the minute with Italian Thai, and, and that's about a third of the underground section of the route, that the construction cost for that is 500 million US dollars, and then Arab's fee and, and my salary are a proportion, smaller percentages of that number. Um, so then, just to look a little bit more detail at the E3 contract section of the Orange Line, there's three stations, or 20, 21 and 22, and three intervention shafts, IVS 15, 16 and 17, and the, the alignment of the metro runs along quite a wide street um, in this uh, suburb of Bangkok. Um, Really, the, the alignment is, is trying to avoid obstructions from foundations of buildings. So running the, the tunnels underneath the street is, is a way to avoid any obstructions from, from other structures. So then this is the team that Andrew and Tim put together to run the project. The people noted in bold were all based in Bangkok. So we had a small team in Bangkok doing a, a design management role, talking to the contractor, uh, understanding their, their needs, and then talking to the offshore teams, so architecture, CNS, geotechnics, and the MEP teams. Everyone else, apart from the people in bold, were based offshore either in Hong Kong or Singapore. Uh, Tunneling was in Singapore, the other teams were all in Hong Kong. And um, so we would the detailed design itself was done offshore and that was communicated to the smaller team in Bangkok and we then coordinate, coordinated with the contractor to explain and to, to take any changes back and adjust the detailed design accordingly. Then this was a time location chart that the contractor put together. I hadn't seen one of these before. Perhaps tunnelers are a bit more uh, used to dealing with this. But what it does, it is quite useful just to spend a little bit of time going through this and understanding it. But along the x-axis on the bottom, we have locations, so the different <coughs> stations and shafts along the alignment, or 20, IVS 16, 21, 17, 22, etc. And then up the, the y-axis on the side, we have time. And as the time progresses, things start to happen across the, across the project. So initially we're working from the eastern section. Um, as, as the time advances, utility diversions at, commence at OR22 and OR21, that's the yellow boxes. And then as, as time advances further, diaphragm walling commences, um, that's the DW with the green, green boxes. Then 
these line, diagonal lines across the, across the screen, that's the TBM drive commencing from so advanced excavation of ore 22 at the western end for the launch shaft, and the TBM drive commences on the westbound side. Um, so in Thailand, the trains drive on the, the left. Um, so the west, westbound tunnel is actually the, the south, the southernmost tunnel drive. Um, so the tunnel, the TBM drive proceeds from ore 22 through IVS 17, through ore 21, uh, and towards ore 20. And then around the end of 2019, the TBM reaches the contract E2 station ore 19, retrieval from OR-19 and brought back to the eastern side to OR-22. Uh, and then that's when the eastbound drive commences, the second TBM drive carries through. So during the, the first, first TBM drive, the station excavations are then proceeding. So after the TBM passes through the station unexcavated, then we're building the roof slab build, in a top-down sequence, building the roof slab, the concourse slab, base slab, and by the time the base slab is complete, then the second TBM drive comes through the excavated station and is dragged through on, on the base slab. So you can see that the whole construction sequencing program revolves around the TBM drives. There's not much time from retrieving one, the TBM at one end, bringing it back to the other, to have completed the station excavations in the meantime from one TBM drive passing to the next one arriving. So quite a tight, tight construction program. The TBM, first TBM was uh, aimed to be launched end of 2018, slight delay, and, and it was just launched last month there. But so that's proceeding pretty much on a little bit behind program, but a, around a five-year construction program from 2017 through to completion um, fit out in 2022. So Crossrail might beat us yet. Um, then this is just to step in through the alignment uh, this is a geological section with a plan above it showing the alignment in plan and, and section together with the geology so you can see there's around 15 meters of soft clay uh, from ground level down this is very soft clay and quite a challenge to deal with then gets into more competent materials, stiff clay and sand layers. So Bangkok's in an alluvial plain. The Chao Priya River flows through Bangkok. There's bedrock maybe around 400 metres depth, but above that we have these alternating layers of clay and sand. Um, groundwater is at ground surface pretty much. There is an underdrain profile. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the groundwater pressure profile later. But what, what we have is a cut and cover tunnel that connects from the, the above ground contract E4 to the, to the east. And then we've got a cut and cover tunnel dropping down into our station OR22. Um, that's an island platform station. Then this, the, the launch shaft was at the western end of OR22 uh, with the, t the tunnels dropping down out of OR22 into more competent material as the TBM drives to the west. Um, we we had to cross over underneath this canal uh, with a, a ro the road currently passes on a bridge, piled bridge over the canal, and those piles uh, they're drawn slightly short of the tunnel, but they actually extended down, and we had to extract the piles and replace the, the canal road bridge with a with a pile structure that was the piles outside of the TBM drive, and to leave the TBM drive clear clear of piles and obstructions. So the, t uh, the TBM passes further to the west, drops down into IVS 17, and then rises back up again uh, and rises up into station OR21, <clears throat> again an island platform station. This, you can see a gap in the second stiff clay layer just below the station. So that posed some problems with groundwater pressures, which I'll talk about later, but you can see all the borehole lines of where we, we, we installed a lot more boreholes than, than usual to try to find and, and limit the extent of, of this hole in the second stiff clay to, to try to find out where exactly that was. Um, so then TBM drives again, dropping out of OR21 to the west and dropping down into IVS 16. 
And just to note that something I learned that it's, it's quite a good practice for TBM drives to drop out of stations and rise back up again into stations just to help the, the energy efficiency of trains that are accelerating out of stations and help with the um, kind of the energy saving to, to be able to move under their own weight downwards and then breaking back up into the stations. So it's, it's quite an efficient design both uh, during construction but mainly for the long term use of, of the metro to have the, the tunnels designed that way. Uh, so then from IVS 16 the TBM drives rising up again and this is where it starts to get a little bit trick, more tricky with uh, a flyover in the centre of the road on piled foundations. So we're dealing with buildings either side of the road on piles and a flyover in the centre on piles and we had to thread the TBM alignments between, between the two to avoid clashing with, with these piles already in the ground. Um, so then the, the alignment passes on up into station OR20, which is wholly underneath the existing flyover, uh, constructed in low headroom underneath the flyover and trying to avoid piles. Then in, in the long term, the, in the permanent case, once the station is completed, the flyover columns were supported by, by the newly completed station. So then the TBM drive um, passes on out of OR20, drops down into IVS15, also underneath this flyover, and, and then passes on down into contract E2 or station OR19. That's just a little bit of quick fly through of the, the alignment, the tunnel alignment through the stations and shafts. Um, so one of my first tasks when I came to Bangkok was to fill in the gaps in the grant investigations. We had a, a tender grant investigation with one borehole per station and around uh, maybe 100, 150 metre spacing along the alignment boreholes. We, we, we added a few more boreholes around the stations to inform the station design and around 50 metre spacing along the, along the rest of the route. Similar technique to borehole construction in the UK, just a shell nogger borehole rig. Um, with, with a bit of fluid support to support the soft um, soils and sand layers. This is the soft clay, so CU of under in shear strength of around 20 kPa, very, very soft, the consistency of toothpaste, something like that, and, and very easy to remould. So this, this posed a problem for um, lateral support. We had to have substantial diaphragm wall construction for the retaining wall excavations in, in the stations and shafts um, uh, all, then for vertical loading for either the tension or compression load cases we, we had to extend the diaphragm wall toe levels down into more competent material into the, the stiffer clays and sands below this is the the water pressure profile then so hydrostatic from ground level but then showing some under drainage because of pumping, um, industrial pumping in the 1980s and although this, this helps for excavation because we're excavating down into water bearing sands with the pressure that's been reduced, we can excavate a little bit closer to those than otherwise could have been the case if we had higher pressures and risk of base, basal heave. Um, it is causing quite a, a problem in Bangkok with subsidence. So in the 1980s, at, at the maximum pumping, whenever water was being pumped at, out, at, extracted at the, at the maximum kind of rate, the, the subsidence was around 100 millimetres per year. Now, with um, some limits on, on that, it has reduced to around 10 or 20 millimetres per year. But there is obvious signs of subsidence, Bangkok sinking, groundwater levels are rising with climate change, and there is a problem that the flooding is, is happening more and more frequently. Uh, but for, I suppose for our design, we, we kept a close eye on monitoring of groundwater pressures with, at depth to inform our excavations to make sure that we didn't have a, a risk of, of basal heave of our excavations as we got close to these, these water-bearing sand layers. Um, this is some testing that we carried out on bentonite. So bentonite is used to support the diaphragm wall 
panels during excavation before, we inst before they're concreted up. Um, the, we, we lowered some clay samples into, into bentonite for 36 hours, which was the construction time of the diaphragm wall panels, and we were able to observe some clumping of bentonite onto the clay, and that would result in a, a per frictional contact between the concrete and, and the clay in situ as we, as we construct our diaphragm walls. Unfortunately, the, the contractor chose the windbent 45 bentonite, which to us showed per performance and, and thicker buildup of bentonite on the clay. Uh, so what we did was specify this barrette load test. So this was a, a load test on a single diaphragm wall panel or a barrette, and we loaded it up to, it, it carried 26 meganewtons in the end, um, and we used that to, to inform the, the different frictional values that we could rely on between the concrete and the, the clay as a result. Then just to talk through the construction sequence that that we worked through for the we worked through for the shafts and stations, they all followed quite a similar sequence where um, we we installed the diaphragm wall retaining walls initially um, using traffic diversions to enable us to work at ground level and, and install the diaphragm wall boxes for the stations. After the diaphragm walls were installed, that then the westbound TBM was able to bore through the completed boxes before any excavation. Then at stage two, we installed a traffic deck over, over the road, supported on the diaphragm walls or, and also on king posts in the centre of the station. <clears throat> and that enabled us to excavate underneath the, the traffic deck and install temporary struts and the permanent slabs, roof slab, concourse slab, and then down to base slab with the trough for the second TBM drive to come through on, on the trough. After the, 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 after the second TBM drive, the eastbound drive passed through the station. We backfilled the trough up to the base slab of the rest of the station, built the platforms, built the internal columns, um, back up to roof slab, then backfilled above roof slab up to ground level and reinstated the road. And that's what it looks like in real life. So this is diaphragm wall construction, taking over half of the road, diverting traffic onto the other half, while we install um, half of the station station box, and then vice versa, we, we divert the traffic over onto the, the side of the road where the diaphragm walls have been installed and complete the rest of the box. This was a study that we carried out for the contractor <clears throat> to determine whether central barrettes would be a more efficient way of supporting vertical loading, either in tension or compression. We looked at a few different load cases and we came, as a, as a result of the different load cases during top-down excavation and lateral loading as well from the retaining wall, uh, the, the tow levels that the retaining walls would need to have to support lateral earth pressures, we came to the conclusion that no central breadth was actually a more efficient station design, and that was because the, the diaphragm wall tow levels were controlled mainly by lateral stability. So by installing central breadths to take more of the vertical loading, we couldn't actually shorten the, the perimeter diaphragm walls, and, and there was no saving then as, as a result. So we carried on with, with the station design with perimeter diaphragm walls and no central breadths. Then another study that we carried out was to look at these gaps in the second stiff clay below OR21. So for water tightness of the excavation, our diaphragm walls around the perimeter were towing into the second stiff clay layer, and we were excavating down to into the first stiff clay layer. Um, <clears throat> if these gaps were left open and not sealed up, then water pressure would be able to pass from the second sand up into the first sand, and the, the, the weight of the clay left, the first stiff clay above the first sand, was insufficient to hold back the water pressure that would be in the first sand layer. So we wanted to reduce the water pressure in the first sand by making a cutoff down right 
to make the, the second stiff clay layer act as a cutoff and keep the water pressure down below that in, in the second sand. Um, so we, we designed a, a grout blanket that would be constructed to seal up this gap in the second stiff, in the second stiff clay. We looked at other options such as smaller bay by bay excavations to, to limit the area over which the pressure would act and, and the frictional resistance that we could rely on. But as that, as that inhibited the contractor's construction sequence quite badly, uh, this was the option they took forward to grind up the holes. Then this was a, an optimization that we worked through for o, station OR20. So originally at the tender stage, we felt that the, the space on the eastern side of OR20, on the right-hand side, was insufficient to be able to squeeze the tunnel between the existing piles of the flyover and the piles of the buildings to the, to the north. Um, so what we had said at tender stage is that these piers would need to be underpinned, the piles would need to be extracted before the tunnel, uh, the, TBMs, the TBM arrived at this location. We, we then looked at, with Italian tie, they, they surveyed some of the piles of the buildings and we found that there was actually enough space between the building piles and the flyover piles to squeeze the TBM through. However, that meant widening the station in order to receive the TBM. The station would need to, the station wall would need to move northwards to receive the eastbound TBM. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, then of the, during the excavation sequence, the flyover was being supported by the, the top-down roof slab. As a result of widening the station, that roof slab span became so large that the flyover couldn't rely just on the, the span of the roof slab and we had to install a row of central barrettes. So these 16 central barrettes in blue were added. But we did save quite a lot of diaphragm wall um, in plan. And then we also saved the, the contractor having to underpin these piers outside of the station. So it, it, it came out as a, a more favorable construction sequence for the contractor and this second option was the one that we took forward. This is what the flyover looks like in real life. So we were installing station OR20 below this flyover, low headroom diaphragm walling equipment, um, and then trying to support this as we excavate. And this is what the construction sequence looks like. So we have the flyover in the center of the road. We have the same issues with moving the traffic to construct the diaphragm walls at ground level, installing a traffic deck, um, and then excavating below that and constructing roof slab, concourse slab, and base slab. But this time we have central barrettes in the station to help support the roof slab span and to help support the flyover above, which the existing piles for the flyover would become unloaded as we excavate, or, or they would have less frictional capacity as we excavate. And, and hence the load would have to be transferred to the new structure as we excavate. Then once we, we get the base slab in, we can build the internal columns and cut out the central barrettes where they didn't um, align with the future column locations. So, so we tried to align the barrettes with the column locations where possible so we didn't have to cut them out, but there were a few that didn't align and we chopped them out later. Then this was an optimization that we went through for intervention shaft 15. Originally this was a box with the a diaphragm wall box with the tunnel drives passing through the, the box itself. Um, and also this has a flyover pier in the center of the shaft and a flyover above. However, to install the diaphragm walls on the north side of the box, the the construction space required for that meant that the businesses on the north side of the road would have to close and couldn't operate during the diaphragm wall construction. So the Italian tie, the contractor, decided to move the diaphragm wall on the northern side southwards so that it was closer to the, the pier and the piles for the existing flyover. But the TBM drive would then pass outside the box and mined edits would be constructed later from the the shaft out to the tunnel. Um, this meant that we would be constructing diaphragm wall panels very close to existing piles, which were supporting a flyover. 
And we were slightly concerned that during the temporary stage where we have an open diaphragm wall panel just supported by bentonite, very close to existing piles, we would reduce the, the capacity of the existing piles. So what we designed was a, a temporary transfer beam that would span from this barrette in the centre of the shaft in green to the completed diaphragm wall in green, first of all. So we would install the green diaphragm walls, then the transfer structure to hold the flyover load. And only after that would we construct the diaphragm walls shown in red, the, the closest ones to the, to the existing piles. Um, and then the TBM would pass later on and, and we'd, we'd construct the mound edits later on. And then, seeing as I'm talking to the, the BTS, I thought I'd better show some, talk a bit more about tunnels than I have done already. So I've dropped this slide in, which shows the, the segments that we cast as a trial. So we, we, we cast some segments and did a few tests, um, including the RAM load on, on the end of the segments, flexural testing. Uh, we built uh, the, the segments into a ring. So this is a, a the tunnel diameter is around six meters. Um, it's a five plus one key segment tunnel. <clears throat> and the segment thickness is 275 millimeters. And that was squeezed down from 300 at tender stage. We, we saved 25 millimeters then on the segment thickness. And as a result of squeezing the thickness down, the, the government checker of our work <clears throat> wasn't happy that we thought we had quite a nice design for our logo to be inscribed on the segments. It's around three millimetres deep, um, just recess for the Arab and the MRTA logos shown. But the government checker said that that three millimetres reduction in your cover zone isn't acceptable. And because we'd squeezed everything down and we didn't have much tolerance left on the cover, we had to do away with the the inscribed logo and just painted on afterwards. Yeah. We kept them happy. This is a 3D model that we put together then of, of the scheme and the surrounding. And even in Bangkok where there's not a lot of infrastructure below ground, it still was very useful. There's lots of piles, obstructions, foundations. You can see in the OR20 area, there's, there is quite a lot still going on. And we find this a very useful way of getting our head around what is actually below ground, looking to see where the clashes were, helped us to inform our design. <clears throat> and then in the future, this will get more and more useful as more and more infrastructure is put below ground in Bangkok. Uh, the, the image on the right is actually a, an augmented reality model where we loaded the model into an iPad and with a 2D drawing on the on the desk, you could point the iPad camera to it and the, the model jumped out of the iPad screen so that you could turn layers on and off and cut sections and, and talk it through with the client or contractor just to, to explain what exactly is going on. So quite a useful piece of work. This is um, a photo of the TBM just last month, ready for launching and is successfully launched after this and is currently boring its way from OR22 towards IVS17 and so far so good from what I hear from the team in Bangkok. So that's, that's kind of technical stuff out of the road and, and then I'll, I'll just talk a little bit now about my experience of life on an overseas assignment in Thailand. Um, I really enjoyed my time there, learned a lot and um, both technically and, and just about the world on that, that side of the world and I would really recommend experience if you, if you get the opportunity. This was the team that we worked with in Bangkok, um, one of our many lunches together, made lots of good friends there. Um, also it, Thailand's quite interesting particularly for Arab because it's a kind of no man's land between the, the bigger offices in Singapore and Hong Kong. And quite often the board would get together, or some of the senior people would get together in Bangkok to, um, for example, this, this event was, they, they planned a lot of events and, and came quite often to Bangkok. 
um, trying to win work and um, expand our presence there. So I found it quite interesting just to rub shoulders with some of the, the senior people in Arab at, on that assignment, a, a very small office, and, and we went out for dinner with the East Asia board a few times. So I think my the back of my head's in there amongst all the others somewhere. Then this was when Boris Johnson was when was on more favourable terms with the government. Uh, he showed up. Uh, he came to the. He was on a visit during his time as foreign secretary. He visited Thailand, and he asked the British ambassador to show him some of the projects that British companies were involved with in Thailand. So he came along and visited our site. I think the the embassy staff were most. Their, their biggest concern was that we wouldn't let him into one of the diaphragm walling rigs. They're, they're scared of him doing some damage, so we managed to avoid that. This is, this is my flat. Um, Arab put me up in a nice flat on the 27th floor of a 35-story apartment building with a swimming pool in the roof. It's so it's quite, quite nice, just... Um, I made good use of the pool and, and appreciated my surroundings there. And from my flat, I, I got a good view of the sunset, probably um, enhanced a little by the air pollution. That's quite a problem in Bangkok. So during our winter, the, the air pollution gets quite bad. Um, but I think I was above most of it at, on the 27th floor. Hopefully it didn't do me too bad too much damage. And then this is a lake that was across the street from my apartment. There's a two kilometer running track around the perimeter of the lake, which I tested out not long after arriving and was surprised at how unfit I felt. So running in 30 degrees was quite different from what I was used to. So I managed to make it round one lap before, before almost collapsing, but then after a year, I, I got used to, to it a bit more, so I made good use of this park. Then I'll just tell you a little bit about Thailand and, and the region as well. So Thailand is a Buddhist country, lots of temples, culture, a good mix of Asian, um, European, sort of Western cultures coming together. Lots of people go there for shopping. I wasn't so interested in that, but um, it seems quite a popular destination for that. And so re really interesting city, lots to see. Um, and then in the region as well, Thailand has beautiful beaches, a nice coastline. This is down in Phuket. Uh, I went a trip down there. Also went up to Chiang Mai in the north, which is a nice part of, part of Thailand as well. Um, then you can't talk about Thailand without mentioning food. So this is uh, one of the many areas where street, there's street food stands along the road. People come along with a kitchen attached to the motorbike and set up camp. Um, and then I walked through this on my way to work and way home again. And quite often was tempted by the smells and ended up taking something home. Thailand has amazing fruit, the tropical fruit. I really enjoyed mangoes and papaya. I didn't actually know that there were so many varieties of banana. I thought a banana is just a banana, but apparently not. There's all, all kinds of shapes and sizes, but very good to sample that. This is a famous Thai dessert, mango sticky rice. I'd recommend you, you try it out if you ever get the chance. It's just very fresh mango with sticky rice and coconut milk. And then I travelled around a little bit too, so I went to Hong Kong, met the design team there. It's an impressive city, impressive skyline. Did a little bit of hiking on the Victoria Peak and the other peaks around about. Uh, this is Kuala Lumpur. The Petronas Towers in the background were the tallest buildings in the world at one stage. So it's, it's sort of located halfway between Bangkok and Singapore geographically, but also a little bit more. Uh, so Bangkok is quite chaotic, but exciting. 
and Singapore people say is sort of very ordered and not as exciting and chaos maybe somewhere in the middle. So people say anyway. Uh, so this is Singapore Harbour. It, it's an impressive city as well. Just everything works very, very well. One metro train leaves and the other arrives within a few seconds. Quite impressed. Okay. And then this is Myanmar, Burma. So I went to trip over there. It's been like stepping back in time. It, it, it's been cut off from the world for a few years. I think it's opening up a little bit now, but <clears throat> um, quite a colonial feel to it as well. This, this street along the front is called the Strand and, and a few buildings sitting around. It could be, some, it could be in London. Um, I took the train down from a city in the north of Myanmar called Mandalay down to Yangon, the capital. Uh, so about 12 hours on a wooden bench on a train. But people are very friendly and, and looked after me and made sure I was, wasn't lost. Uh, so I'd recommend a trip if you get the chance as well. Um, and that's, that's it. So thanks for listening and happy to take some questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Maybe I can, st I can start with one. Uh, what was the general health and safety atmosphere um, in, in Bangkok? Yeah. Is it much different to what we have here? Yeah, a, a little bit. Like I was pleasantly surprised that it's better than I had expected. So the, the contractor was actively trying to look after their staff. Definitely our was the same as it is here. We, we weren't present on site very often. Mm -hmm. So we would, and when we did go, we would make sure that our safety was looked after in the same way that it would be in the UK. Um, definitely there's things that the contractor does differently and, and their perception of providing a good, safe environment was lower than what my perception would have been, but they were making an, you know the kind of best efforts that they could have made, really. So yeah, I was pleasantly surprised, but obviously the level is a bit less than here. But there's room for improvement, yes. But um, they they are doing sort of going beyond what what you might expect. Okay. There was a question at the back. How do you find working with um, Thai people that tend to smile a lot more than other places? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I really enjoyed it actually. So it does take a little bit of getting used to. So Thai people are very calm, don't get excited until you push them over the edge. So there is a, a line still that a few times I, I crossed by accident. Um, but generally, very so obviously the contractor needed to make money needed the project to advance quickly but everything was done with a smile and um, there was no aggression between the contractor and ourselves um, very good work environment very good relationship but sometimes we did have to ask a lot more questions to really find out what the contractor was thinking so we would say is that yes you do want to do something or yes you don't want to do it because the, they were quite reluctant just to disagree. We'd maybe find out a week later that they didn't like what we were doing and then we'd have to go back and rework. So we, we would try to to get decisions clarified and um, just double and triple make make sure this is is this really what you want before you come back later and tell us something different. But, yeah, no, really good environment to work with, and you just need to to read the expressions a bit more to understand is is this a yes or a no? And my second question is, how is it working with Italian Thai and their relatively lower standards compared to European companies? Um, so lower standards in what what way? Well, partly health and safety, but also the, the quality on site, for example, and and yeah. their tolerances. Yeah, um, so we have worked with Italian Thai for the past 20 years and, and we are aware of what way they work with concrete quality, for example, and tolerances. But 
I think over that relationship, we have helped to guide them into taking more pride in their work. Not, you know, they have they learned their trade from a Japanese tunneling contractor. So the initial Blue Line project was funded by the Japanese government, and that was a joint venture with Japanese contractors with Italian tie. And they have so, the, the, for example, the concrete quality in the tunnel segments was was very impressive. And the diaphragm walling, bentonite and concrete, maybe a little bit more uncertain, but from what we've seen so far of the excavations, it, it's also very good quality. Um, so I think we have, over the years, tried to guide them into good working practice pays off, and, and they are reasonable quality. Obviously, they're more geared up to perhaps taking risks than Arab would be, and, and we would try to guide them but not force them into a decision so at the end of the day if they want to make a take a risk with all of the information then they're in the best position to to take that risk um so it yeah it was a it wasn't a joint venture we were the subcontractor or the sub consultant of the contractor and we tried to guide them as best we could and i think we we're impressed with the quality that we achieved Thank you very much for an excellent balance of the technical and personal experiences you had. My daughter lived out in Bangkok for three years, and I always enjoyed going out to visit her. I'm a great fan of public transport, but I never took the train out to the airport. And one of the reasons for that, and, and you're quite right about the traffic being quite chaotic on occasions, but the taxi fares are so ridiculously low there. Um, you know, normally that becomes a factor uh, in, in choosing public transport because the alternatives are really expensive. And I just wondered if that, that was your experience, if you'd ever taken the mass transit out to the airport or whether you went by taxi and how difficult it might be to get the Thai people to actually start using the public transport more than they seem to. Yeah, yeah I think definitely for a short trip to Thailand, the, the taxis are cheap compared to what we're used to. Living there, just... I was able to compare prices to everything else. So you can you can eat for one pound, the taxi fare is maybe five pounds to the airport, whereas the the under the metro out to the airport is one pound. So it's I I took the metro most times unless I had a lot of luggage just because it's easy to do and, and the ta but yeah I, I agree the taxi fares are cheap. Thai people We'd probably consider on a Thai salary consider them a relative, not a luxury, but something that you wouldn't just do on a whim. Um, but th there is a problem that the, tax the taxi drivers aren't very happy because the taxi fares have been set by the government and haven't been increased for ten years, or the, they haven't been allowed to increase the fares. So I'm not sure if. The really, you know, the taxi drivers are suffering a bit um, because inflation hasn't reached their their limits on, on how much they can charge. So I agree that it is a lower fare than it should really be, um, but still, for I, I think if there was a, a decent metro system, the Thai people would use it, and and they do they do use the, the the system that's there. It just needs to be expanded. Right. Thank you. So so when you travelled on the, the the metro system, you found it it was being used by quite a number of yep. people. Yeah, oh, right. it's, it's very busy. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, we've got one. Oh. Cool. So, constructing a station and a tunnel just under a wider. How many iterations or designs did you have to go for that? Sorry, just start your. What was the start of your question? I mean, you constructed the. Well, you were parallel with the viaduct all the way through for a good bit of your alignment. Yeah. Um, so, I just repeat the question again. Thanks. Well, let's simplify it. In terms of third party, impact on third party infrastructure, yeah. how big a challenge was the project? Oh, okay. And how was it different to delivering something similar to that uh, in a place like London? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot more straightforward, really, than, than third-party interfaces in London. 
So the Metro Authority had already kind of safeguarded all of the land that we needed to obtain. For the, so that kind of element of, um, I suppose, just planning and, and getting access to land, etc., was all done by the government. Then for ground movements and the kind of impact of working with utilities companies, etc., they were, I'm not sure how much of that was almost forced by the government to be involved again to and, and also replace and renew their uh, infrastructure as well, so kind of give them better betterment. Then ground movements and impact on nearby buildings was probably the biggest challenge. So, however, there, even in that case, it's more straightforward than in London. So in London, if you have five or ten millimetres of settlement, everyone panics. In Thailand, you don't really panic until it's over maybe 100 millimetres. So because everything's on piles, then the, the, the actual impact of ground movement is much less. Um, so there is, there is a lot more ground movement, but and, and utilities would be designed with flexible connections, etc. So a lot of stuff moves around. There's a lot of substance. The top 15 metres is not too sure what's going on half the time, but... Um, the, the main structures are, are in piles and not as affected by shallow excavation movements. The bigger problem it would be if we did have a problem with groundwater coming in the base of our excavations, then we'd have a, a larger kind of drawdown settlement profile to do with groundwater pumping, and that's that's where we'd start to have more problems. But um, for, for our project, we weren't doing any of that, and the shallow ground movements we were getting weren't weren't damaging the structures. I think we had a question on the bottom or mid. Hi, Paul. Thanks for the presentation and thanks for sharing your knowledge with the Hi. Orange Metro. I'm Daud and I'm a student at the University of Warwick. I just got a quick question. It really looks impressive uh, when you do the uh, pile testing using the ground anchoring method with the several layers of ice and I'm just wondering, I can't imagine that one, what is the ultimate load of it? Would you mind describing about the uh, pile size and depth and what is the ultimate load that you have achieved it? Because I've just carried a similar method a couple of, a few years ago. I'm just wondering. Right. <clears throat> so, well, the maximum test that's ever been done in Bangkok is, I think it's, so at the minute they're, they're planning construction of the tallest building in Thailand, another tallest building, and I think they did a barrette test there up to 50 meganewtons, um, around 100 metres deep, something like that, and for a tower that would be perhaps 500 metres tall, something like that. Um, <clears throat> so generally, barrettes would be used for deep excavation, deep foundations, and that's a diaphragm wall rig that, that just can excavate into the, the clays and sands to, to great depth. Piles, board piles are, are still used, but not to such large depths. So to get maximum loading, um, we'd use barrettes, and, and then you can, I think that's it's around 100 metres, the current depth that, that we're going to, I suppose, as as equipment is developed further, you might be able to go deeper and get more more capacity, but that's, that's the current kind of limits. All right, thank you. And then, uh, do you do any ground support like to avoid the water seepage, uh, like uh, like kind of vertical grouting from the ground surface? What kind of support? Grouting, grouting from the ground surface. Uh, to support, to support. Uh, I mean, to avoid the seepage of the water. Okay, yes, so, so we, at the tunnel connections into the stations, those areas were grouted up in advance of the tunnel. So after, after the stations had been excavated and we were boring through into the excavated station, the, the, the soil for a couple of metres around that zone where the TBM would break through, that was grouted up with um, just jet grouting to... To, to help with permeability of the soil and, and when, the, when the TBM would break through so that you don't have a, a water path through. 
All right, thank so, you. Thank you so much. Paul, you mentioned that there was a governmental checker. Uh, what, what was their responsibility, and, and um, is this sort of the, the normal government um, that, that does it for all projects in yeah, it's, it's It's quite a common thing in Asian projects. Singapore and Hong Kong, the checker has a lot of power. Um, in Thailand, not so much. So they, they, still have a, they still sign off the final design and construction drawings, and we need to get their approval. But they listen to us a bit more. So we were developing some designs that they weren't familiar with. And we, we, once we explained it to them, they were happy to, to sign it off. Whereas in Hong, places like Hong Kong, Singapore, it's a lot more prescriptive. You can't, the, the government checker says you have to do it this way and you, there's, there's no flexibility. And so I think it's a good position where there is oversight um, and, and someone checking on behalf of the government to make sure that the contractor is, is doing what they should be doing. Um, but there's still room for flexibility of design. So I think, I think it was a good role. If there's no more further questions, we can move on to the chair slides for today, please. So a couple of announcements. Um, the first BTSYM workshop will be on risk management. Um, this has been delivered by the Berkshire uh, Hathaway Special Speciality Insurance and Underwriters, uh, Liberty Specialist Markets, and uh, Ruler Consult. I think they've got a good mix of people in the same room, um, so it's one not to be missed. The booking details are on our website. Um, it runs from 2 o'clock to 5.30. Next one, please. The workshop is then followed by the BTS March meeting on Elan Valley Aqueduct um, by Barhel. On the 15th of March is our conference. Um, you can book, if you go to the next slide, sorry. Uh, yes, it's our 15th of March is our, is our conference, um, which is delivered by young members. Um, it's free for our members to attend. Uh, all the booking uh, information is on our website. Um, we are still calling for presentations. Um, if you are not a BTS member, you can buy a ticket for £62 or become a member for £40. Um, you can do the maths on that. And if there are any students and apprenticeships, apprentices, is we're offering uh, eight free tickets for anyone who would like to attend. Um, next slide, please. We are calling for presentations. Um, it is only a 15-minute slot. Um, it could be anything about a current project you, you're working on or, or a project you have worked on um, or a paper or a research project. Next slide, please. Uh, the committee are working on a trip to Belma. This is a construction um, fetre, uh that is run every three years, I believe. Um, it's from the April uh, 12th of April to the 14th. Uh, we're currently looking to secure 10 sponsorship places, um, but everything else from flights, accommodation to food will be covered by uh, the individual. If you are interested, uh, an email went out today um, to all the members, um, so please, if you are interested, do respond, um, and uh, Thomas will give you more information. The BTS Tunnel Design Construction Course for 2019, the booking is now open. It's a five-day course held at Warwick. Uh, it gives a very good introduction to tunneling um, from all scenarios, from the design to construction, methodology to risk, uh, health and safety. Um, it really is a really good course, and it's delivered by uh, industry experts. Again, that's on the 1st to the 5th of July. Um, all the booking information is on the website. And final announcement, the BTS uh, annual dinner, um, which will be held on the 10th of May. The YM have two tables and are at discounted prices. So if you do like, uh, we'd like a discount code, uh, if you please contact uh, Wojciech. Um, again, the details are on the website. And we'd like to, we'll see you there. Um, before we head off, a final thank you to Paul. Um, and we'll see you downstairs at the bar, which has been kindly sponsored by Arup. Thank you. <laughs>